Welcome along all. Uh, so today's webinar, we are going to be talking about Martin Audio's 50 year history. Business started in 1971, so we've got a lot to talk about. So we'll dive straight on in there. Good morning and welcome. My name is Robin Dibble. I'm a product support engineer for Martin Audio. So my day job is uh, writing webinars and training, presenting webinars and training, system design, uh, education, system commissioning, pretty much anything that falls under the banner of technical support, along with uh, my splendid colleagues. Uh, ben Tucker, one of my uh, product support group team, is also online with me today to answer any questions that you have as we go through, and there'll be an opportunity for a Q&A at the end. So Martin Audio were true pioneers in professional touring sound. The company was founded in 1971 by an Australian, uh, a guy by the name of Dave Martin, strangely enough. Um, he wanted people to go to gigs and enjoy it. You've paid for a ticket, or in back in those days, you've gone to your free festival. It would be quite nice if everybody could hear the band that they wanted to see, which frankly wasn't happening. Now, this gig is legendary. It's the Beatles at Shea Stadium in 1965. It's the reason the Beatles stopped touring, because nobody could hear them. Uh, the reason for that is, well, their PA system was comprised of the things you can see on the right hand side there. Vox Grenadier columns, four 10 inch speakers in there. They were nothing more than radio speakers, to be honest. Each one with a 10 watt power rating. So you've got four 10 inch drivers, 40 watt rating in a column, very narrow bandwidth, no upper mid and top end whatsoever coming out of those drive units. It's gonna sound pretty much uh, like a 1950s steam powered radio. Back in the UK, things were much better in 1969. The Rolling Stones Free Festival at Hyde Park, you can see here, uh, all of which was powered by WEM. Now, of course, WEM is a legendary name in the rock and roll touring business uh, as the ones who really started live sound for bands. To an extent, that's true. But what you can see here are uh, four by 12 inch columns uh, from the WEM Canon. They also made four by 10 and four by four and a whole plethora of strange looking boxes that did strange things. Now, Charlie Watkins, the man behind WEM, uh, provided PA to many of the bands of this period, and he was dedicated to getting the best sound he possibly could to the audience. Sadly, he didn't really have much of an idea about how to do that. Uh, he was a musician, not an engineer, uh, and his basis for designing systems was very much on what he thought might sound nice. And you can see some of the strange creations, uh, those tweeter arrays, for example, on top of that pile there. I do love that WEM warning. Audio power in excess of four kilowatts is dangerous to approach this sound generator bank unless adequately protected. Wow, scary stuff. Now, WEM did build larger stuff later on. There were things like the festival stack, which was a four way system, but the driver configuration was always strange. It didn't quite work and there were no crossovers between anything other than a passive high pass filter on the horns. There were no crossovers, nothing active. It was all just driven off 70 watt PA amplifiers per cabinet. It didn't achieve very much above massive amounts of comb filtering and coloration, sadly. Although I do find that parabolic reflector uh, a very fascinating piece of kit. And that's a principle which um, uh, Mr. Meyer, of course, generated uh, more interest in, in later years. It wasn't that the gear wasn't around, uh, it was. I mean, uh, fully horn loaded two way systems have been around in cinemas for many, many years. And a lot of the bigger bands, especially the American bands were touring systems based on things like these RCA Shearer horns uh, and the Altec multi-cells you can see on the slide here. Of course, there was also the popular uh, Altec voice of the theater systems, which were slightly more compact and people were using. Now those existed in the UK, it just seemed that it didn't occur to anybody over here to start using those as a sound system. They were efficient, they were horn loaded, which is why people were using them. Trouble was the American bands were bringing stuff like this over to the UK and then they couldn't afford to ship it back. So it got abandoned over here. And then PA companies like one called IES would pick it up cheap because the bands couldn't afford to ship it home, which was great. And that was Dave Martin's debut on the UK PA scene, working for IES with gear like this. 
Now, he got a bit fed up with trying to lug these massive speakers around the country and worked on something which was a little more easy to handle. Now, you can see here uh, on the left hand side, the first prototypes of what was to become the B215 base horn and stacked on top of it. There are two Vitavox flares and these were driven by the JBL Classic 2482 uh, two inch exit compression drivers. Altogether more compact, easy to move around, but still with the benefits of a much wider bandwidth than uh, the conventional band PA systems of the time. You can still see the WEM column there being used as a side fill on the stage. Come 1973 and Pink Floyd have bought a large Martin system. Uh, this is Earl's Court and you can see basically the same arrangement. It's the 215 bass horn, the same Vitavox flares with JBL compression drivers on the back. But you can see here, bullets have been added for high frequency for better high frequency extension and coverage through the room now this is still not a perfect system by any means but it is a lot better than what came before and add into this the fact that the martin audio ethos is already in action here this idea of getting the best possible sound quality to every member of the audience up at the top there you can see four flown stacks to get the sound out to those sitting on the bleachers and the back of the room as best as possible, not just the ground stack stuff on the floor, which was most common in gigs in those days. There you go, that's a close up of the arrays. You can see we have a new, more stacks of 215s and the Vitavox horns up in the gods there to get the sound to the back of the room. Now the 215 was a great bit of kit, but it was still a bit cumbersome and heavy. So Dave took a saw to the 215 and created the legendary 115, which became the staple of so many touring systems through the 70s and 80s. Highly efficient and very punchy. That was the, always the sonic character of these 15 inch folded horns. They would run them up to about 250 Hertz. They went down to 40, so they weren't a sub. They were a very kicky bass box and they'd be supplied with a selection of different drive units. Different people had different preferences. But the most common would be TADs, JBLs or Gauss or the original Martin B38, which I believe was actually an RCF drive unit. So this was the Mark I version of what was to become the modular system in all its glory. The 115 bins, the Vitavox horns with JBL drivers and the optional Super Tweeter array loaded with either two or four JBL bullets, depending on your order. Now, we can also see here the beginning of Martin Audio's illustrious stage monitoring career. Uh, this is loaded with a JBL E140 drive unit, the classic JBL pepper pot lens and a 2420 compression driver. One of the neatest stage monitors you'll see from this era. There was a lot of them around which would have a couple of 12s and an acoustic lens on top. Uh, big boxes that uh, dominated the stage, but Martin's approach was very much to the compact and high power. Now, these original systems were scoring uh, a lot of fans. Now, back in 1971, there was a guy called Jeff Dexter who was responsible for um, looking after the PA and technical facilities in, in many of London's iconic venues. And they set up a demo in the Roundhouse um, with the WEM Festival system, high watt stacks, uh, the Kelsey horns that were very popular at the time, RCA and Gourmont Carly cinema systems and the Martin system. The roundhouse was empty and they stacked this lot up. Uh, but Dave, as always, was a clever guy. Rather than putting everything on the stage like everybody else, he put the base bins up in, in the stacks up in the galleries aimed towards the center of the circle. So keeping the energy into the middle of the room, not firing it at the walls. So we're reducing the amount of energy and uh, slap back off the room. And we're also reducing what's going to go out into the environment and pollute the neighbors with sound. So even back in 71, we were uniting the audience, keeping them happy inside whilst keeping the levels down outside in the local environment. They moved house from Covent Garden in 1975, and you can see they have some very interesting neighbors. So Martin Audio were indeed next door to Midas at the very beginning. This axis became the sort of uh, guiding core of the British touring sound industry right through the 70s and into the 80s. Midas, desks, Martin Audio sound systems, that was pretty much the way it went. 
So this was an early development with Midas. So that's a Dave Martin designed four-way flight cased PA system there uh, with a Midas console, which had built in active crossovers to drive the PA. That's the four slides you can see in the middle of that console there and uh, a complete power amp pack. So that's a four-way power amp in a box you can see there in the center stock on the flight case, which would power, one of those would power each of those four-way stacks. Stanhope Street, again, this is the R&D workshop. Now, um, uh, for the audio geeks like me, you will notice the stack on the right-hand side of HHS500D power amps. You can see they're separated by wooden blocks to keep them running cool. Now, the uh, S500D was Mike Harrison and company's answer to the Crown DC300A, uh, one of the first solid state high power amplifiers. They have many things in common. The 500D was a smaller format. They were both similar output power. They're both run down to two ohms and they both had a tendency to go DC at short notice and blow your speakers up. Oh, the early days of transistor power amps. So Dave's two stroke three way system was uh, a huge change. It completely changed the sound of rock and roll forever, but there was still something missing. And that something was in the vocal band. It was lacking power, warmth and impact You would it, because it had a two inch compression driver, which isn't good at getting down into those low mid range frequencies. And so enter the MH212, the filler shave, uh, the quintessential piece of Martin audio kit that defined the Martin audio sound for the rest of time. Not only did it bring warmth and body to vocals, but uh, also it meant that you got the impact of the snare drum. Um, you could get the chiming edge of guitars without distortion, completely changed the sound of PA, of rock and roll PA for the future. No idea why it was called the filler shave, because it doesn't actually look like a filler shave. Filler shaves were rotary razors, of course, this looks more like a Remington to me, but hey, who are we to argue with posterity? So the MH212 ran from 250 hertz to one and a half K, bringing all that power and energy into that envelope that a two inch on a horn just really couldn't do, uh, bringing the humanity to the sound, the warmth and the impact and projecting vocals out to the audience within the room for the first time. Later on came a new radial horn, the HF2M, um, which was also another Martin Audio legendary product running from one and a half K up. Often again, bullets were deployed above these. Cooper Kennedy of RMB Audio sums up pretty well the experience of the MH212 the first time people heard it. He said it was the compression, the force and the impact of the sound, not just the loudness. I've never heard vocals, guitars or drums sound like that. At 150 feet, you could feel the snare drum slap you in the face and feel it on your skin. Mission accomplished, I'd say. Now, with the MH212 on board, we needed more power at the low end. So... Uh, more bass boxes came along. Firstly, there's the uh, uh, B215, a new dual 15 version of the iconic 115. Same profile, so low profile box, but this time with the, uh, with the horn slightly redesigned so you've got two drive units venting into that acoustic space. Then there were the S series. These were S-bin uh, subwoofers, which went down below the 215s and 115 to add that extra octave down in the low end. The Phyllis Show's first big tour was out with Supertramp when they toured uh, their classic album Breakfast in America. And it seems the system made quite an impression. When the press start talking about the quality of the sound system, when normally it's the last thing they mention, you know that you must be doing something right. It was a big rig. There were 48 of the dual 15 bins, 36 filler shaves, accompanied with 48 MLR horns and drivers, a very popular combination in the US back in the day, 24 of the Midas power block amps, 36 HHS500Ds. Now there's some more names uh, which are synonymous with the UK rock and roll industry coming in now. Brook Siren Systems, or BSS as it became, they're MCS 200 crossovers, the classic Clark Technic DN27 graphic EQs, and some custom Midas consoles. Now this rig for the US tour was bought uh, by the band, but by the end of the tour, a conglomerate had formed of the techs, roadies and engineers who were on it, who bought the rig from them at the end of the tour. And that was the birth of Delicate Productions, uh, a company that Martin Audio has long been associated with in the US ever since. 
Another name that's common to many across the rock and roll industry, Keith Davis. Now, uh, back in the 70s, he was running a hire company called PASE in Yorkshire, which grew out of a company providing PA systems for working men's clubs up in the north. Now, he bought his first Martin rig in 1979. Now, of course, Keith went on to form uh, Capital Entertainments in London when he moved south, which became the iconic Capital Sound. Classic combination again here, you can see the Midas consoles, uh, DC300A power amplifiers and Clark Technic graphics and the BSS crossovers in the rack. And suddenly we were everywhere. Um, it wasn't just the power and punch now, it was the clarity as well that was getting Marston Audio noticed and getting our PA on pretty much everybody who was every, anybody's rider. Uh, all of that power and intimacy and that ability to bring an audience into the performance is something which had not been possible before. But Dave's systems were bringing that sound to every member of the audience. A look at a few systems from the era. This is the early 1980s. Regicine, long uh, a rental partner of ours back in the day in France. Pretty much everything in the modular catalogue you can see there. There's some uh, 215s, some 115s. There's the uh, S-bins the filler shaves, the, the horns, and of course, the bullets. This is Ziggy, the boss of Regicine with Dave Martin back in the day. Moved to 1982, and this was a gig with um, Dom Tom Club and Talking Heads at the Panathinaikos Stadium, another long-term partner of the Dave Bond studio back there who clearly liked their rig with the grills off. Uh, again, two 1.5s, a couple of 1.1.5s in there. Uh, the filler shaves and the HF2 horns. 1984, Glastonbury. Yes, we were still there all that time ago. Uh, in a tent this time, again, you can see there, uh, that is uh, S-bins on the stage with filler shaves and big JBL radial horns. One of the most well-known names in British touring uh, through the 80s was Concert Sound, founded by Tim Boyle, um, who ran the PA system for a Welsh rock band by the name of Man back in the 1970s. And Concert Sound, like many other companies of this era, grew out of Man buying their own PA. And the system they bought originally was the Martin Audio Mark I modular. And as Tim said, they again hired the Rainbow for a day and tried three PAs, including the Midas Martin combination. And it was just streets ahead of the rest of the PA. The Martin audio system sounded so much better. But then roll on to 1985 and Concert Sound are on tour with Dire Straits, uh, with the famous flying tea trays and what frankly looks like some very scary rigging. Uh, you can This method of running the modular PA in stacks of each frequency band became more and more common as more people experimented and understood that by doing this we're starting to get some vertical coupling between the cabinets giving better projection so stacked systems uh, with individual bands work far better than just a stack of base mids tops and a whole bunch of them side by side and that's what modular was capable of doing because of its component nature this is dire straits again uh this time is in italy uh, and this is an ultimate expression of that stacking principle. You can see the 115s, the filler shaves and the HF2s all in vertical stacks. Now, this system needs a little bit more explanation because um, this was also run as three discrete systems. So each of those stacks that you can see there is running a different mix. So you would have uh, a combination of maybe vocals and guitars or vocals and keys in one stack, bass and drums in another. Uh, to separate the sound through the system. That way you've got more headroom in each section. And also the principal reason for doing this was to stop the horizontal comb filtering. If all of those sat next to each other, were all running the same signals, you get a lot of comb filtering in the horizontal plane. But by running a different mix through each stack, that problem goes away. And by the time you get far away from the, from the system, as 99% of the audience will be, then it's all merged into one sound front anyway. So you actually get a positive impact by arranging a system in this way. Now, at this time, it wasn't just Capital Sound, uh, Concert Sound who were running these systems. There was the fledgling Capital Sound. There was ML Executive, the Who's PA company based at Shepperton Studios. 
uh, and just pretty much everybody. As you will see on the next slide, all the big touring companies were using Martin Audio. Uh, Colab, Tasco, uh, the whole lot of them. If you were a bit major tourer, then Martin Audio was the system that you went to. And who's using the system? Well, it reads like a who's who of the rock and roll industry. Everything from ABBA to Yes, everybody was taking Martin Audio out on the road. It wasn't just the big touring systems. There was a lot of custom work that um, Dave would do for individual customers when they had particular requirements. You can see here um, uh, drum fill for uh, Carl Palmer of ELP, uh, which is currently held by Chris Hewitt up at CH Vintage PA in the north of England. If you've got some spare time, guys, I highly recommend you go to the CH Vintage website. Google it, you'll find it. Um, he has a museum of rock and roll history, all the gear through WEM, Martin Audio, all kinds of exciting stuff. And if you're ever in the UK or are in the UK and get the opportunity, make an appointment, go see Chris. All the gear is available for hire as well for those vintage events. Because Martin Audio was still a relatively small company, we could build a lot of custom stuff uh, and we were very flexible in what we did. I came across a custom system in uh, Bournemouth Pavilions back in the early 1990s that David built for, for the room there. And lots of the custom stuff would then make its way into the catalogue. You can see versions of the ELP and Moon Monitor there on the left hand side, but also custom disco systems. Then along came F1. More and more the gear needed to be flown. Uh, and so Dave was working on developing the F1 flying PA system. Again, Tim Boyle had a play with this on Leo Sayre tour and tried it out in Harricate and said it was a beautiful, stunning system, but Dave didn't have many of them. Uh, F1 ultimately became a product that was never fully developed uh, and was never on the mass market because F2 came along. And the whole concept of PA systems changed from um, this modular arrangement through to one box full range systems. Times have changed, fashions have changed and boxes like these came along. So it's the RS1200 uh, and this here is the RS800. Uh, full range systems all horn loaded in the classic Martin audio way. Everything in a box, all you need below this is your infras, your subs. Um, and that was very much the way things were going in the 1980s. So this here is um, Spandau Ballet on tour with Capital Sound. Uh, the RS1200 is flown and you can also see in the center there, there is a flown single center fill of the F1 system. Spandau Ballet again, I'm not sure the venue, I've got a feeling this is Southampton, uh, but you can see again RS1200s uh, ground stacked and flown. It's a true full range system, uh, frequency response down to about 35 hertz, all horn loaded again. So in the 1980s, um, the watchword on everybody's lips was high power portable systems. Um, uh, the, the infamous Bose 802 had kind of opened the door um, uh, and everybody was trying to build uh, compact systems that bands could, that smaller bands could take on the road with them, didn't need a team of roadies to move around, but gave high performance sound. Uh, my own father used to write for a series of magazines back in the 80s and did a series of um, tests on products in this marketplace and the strap line on the on the articles was better than Bose question mark because that was the strap line everybody seemed to be using at the time but of all those we tested and listened to there was one which outshone the rest of them and predictably it came from Martin Audio. Bill Webb's first solo design project for Martin Audio it was the CX2. This thing really packed a punch full of the Martin Audio sound, real rock and roll energy to the box. Uh, it had a single ATC 12 inch low frequency drive unit with a coaxially mounted uh, horn with a Foster compression driver on the back. The BX2 was its partnering sub and it came with a processor, um, a dedicated electronic controller as they used to be called in those days, crossover between the two boxes, limiter and system voicing all taken care of in the box. Early 80s, this is the time when that process, that, uh, that way of doing things was becoming more and more common. 1987, all changed at Martin Audio as it moved out into the suburbs 
and just around the corner from where our current factory is now. So a new factory and office uh, in High Wycombe at Lincoln Road. This is the factory floor of the time that looks very much like um, F2 modules being built there. The demo room with uh, one of our Midas XL3 demo consoles, not many input channels, lots of output channels. And the management team of the time. Nineteen eighty seven, the time that F2 was launched, a completely radical rethink of the way to combine a one box system with the flexibility of the modular approach from the original Martin Audio PA. The F2 was combined at the low end with the F2B low frequency cabinet. It was a dual 15 inch hyperbolic horn, great sounding punchy PA system with all the hallmarks of a Martin Audio system. It was based around the F2R rack, which came pre-wired with the connectors on the back. And into this would go a bunch of different modules depending on your application. So for example, for a short throw system, you would have uh, the low mid horn, upper mid horn, upper mid high section, uh, and maybe some bullets or the super high horn that uh, came along later. Basic long throw stack. So now again, we're stacking our uh, multiples of the mid sections and high frequency sections to get better projection and throw. So you can build the system and put it together in such a way that you get every part of the audience covered from long throw for the seats at the back to wider coverage near fill at the front. Uniting the audience is not just a strap line with Martin Audio, it's always been at the heart of everything we do, the ethos behind our system's design. And even at this stage, this idea of being able to create long or short throw systems to get the best possible coverage throughout an audience region, very much a part of that. Oh, of course, there's the mid-range again. So uh, the F2M mid-horn, uh, the basic principles it was designed on go back to the filler shave and ran over the same bandwidth. Uh, in this case, 220 hertz to 1.5K, so going down a little bit lower. Again, it's this cone-driven uh, mid-range. It's a carbon fiber cone, five and a half inch diameter in a compression chamber. So it's a compression-loaded cone drive unit. That whole thing which Martin Audio carries on through into its big three-way systems even today. The first serious tour for F2 was with Sade in 1987. Roger Lindsay was the front of house engineer who was called in uh, by Keith Davis of uh, Capital Entertainments, Capital Sound as it became, because they got the they got the job for the Sade tour and she was looking for a good front of house engineer. He got in touch with Roger Lindsay and Roger Lindsay said, I remember joking at the time that Dave couldn't have built the PA because it sounded too good. So clearly he hadn't previously been a fan of Martin Audio Systems. But F2 was a huge success on the Sade tour. Its combination of exceptional mid-band clarity and um, projection along with detail and resolution, perfect for Sade's beautiful voice. The whole tour was a great success and Dave ended up with the presentation of a gold disc in recognition of his services for the tour. Now, fledgling Capital Sound, which grew out of Capital Entertainments, invested in F2 in a very big way for what was a very small company. Um, and F2 was the house system. They were chosen for their dedication and their ability by Nick Baker, Simple Minds front of house engineer, to provide the sound for a very large Simple Minds tour at the end of the 80s. And Nick said that the F2 modular system was extremely adaptable. It could handle long or short throw as being, by being used as a combi cab, and whatever the combination you used, it always sounded good. This idea of consistency of sound quality throughout the audience, obviously part of what we do at Martin Audio. This at the time was one of the biggest and loudest systems ever assembled in the world. Uh, an F2 rig combinations of long throw and near field cabinets uh, with the F2B base boxes at the Torhout Werchter Festival in Belgium. Uh, for a very short period of time, because of course people are always trying to beat it, it was apparently the loudest system that had ever been assembled in the world, until of course Motorhead went on tour next. 1995, Boy Band Central, take that uh, on tour. Uh, this is Earl's Court in 1995, Capital Sound again with the F2 system. Meanwhile, there was a lot of change happening within Martin Audio as a business. 
They've sold it on uh, to the TGI group, Tannoy Goodman's Industries, in 1990. And the legend that is David Bissett Powell came on board as the MD in 91, uh, when Dave took a step back and stayed on as a part-time engineering director. That was until devastating news in 1992. Dave had been found dead, murdered by his business partner in an outside venture. David becoming increasingly involved in more and more stuff outside of the Martin Audio business, other interests to pursue, and things had clearly gone very wrong. Um, the guy was convicted, he was jailed, and as far as I know, he's still in there. One of David Bissett Powell's first moves had been to bring uh, Bill Webb back into the fold. Now, Bill had been involved in the business back in the, uh, the days when Philiche was being developed. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, CX2 was very much his baby. He came back to introduce Martin Audio into the installation marketplace and also to design and bring to market the successor to the F2 at the famous Wavefront series. Bill's first task, though, was to bring Martin Audio into the installation market. Uh, the EM series were instantly popular. Uh, we still get inquiries today for spare drive units and replacement parts. They seem to last forever, these loudspeakers, and they sounded great. It came about initially because we were getting uh, more and more inquiries about uh, installing F2 systems. Now, F2 is probably a little over-specified in terms of engineering and therefore cost for an installation application. And that was the ethos behind bringing the EM series to market, to bring uh, some Martin Audio fairy dust and sound quality into this space in smart cabinets that gave all the performance and ruggedness that was required and reliability in the installation market. And ever since, installation has been a core part of the Martin Audio story. In 1996, uh, the W8 series was Bill's first complete touring system for Martin Audio. Complete packages, amplifiers, racks, controllers, processors, rigging in new point source, full range touring systems. What you can see here is the original W8 uh, and the W8S hybrid loaded 18 inch subwoofer. The W8 had two 12 inches on the low mid, horn loaded with a compressing phase bung on the 12. The six and a half inch compression loaded mid range with again this toroidal phase plug and a single one inch compression exit compression driver for the high frequency. There was a long throw version of it, which basically took each uh, element of the Wavefront 8 system and stacked them up in much the way that uh, F2 had been based and modular before it. And you can see here the low, mid, mid and high sections as vertical arrays in the long throw system. Now, while we've got a picture of that horn section opened up, you can see these toroidal phase bungs on the mid-range drivers. Uh, now, they're doing two things. One is they're putting some compression loading on front of the cones, so it increases the efficiency of the drive unit. But the reason they're toroidal, the reason they are rings, is because they also aid dispersion in the upper frequency band of the mid-range driver, making these very wide band horns, which is why we can get down from 350, 400 hertz, all the way up to 3.5 or 4K, and still maintain good pattern control. So what's happening with those is that center of the toroidal phase bung becomes a source in itself. Because it's a narrower source than the wide horn mouth, it works better at higher frequencies because the wavelengths are shorter. That's what gives this wide band ability in our mid-range horns. The combination of a wider mouth device for the low end and a smaller exit device for the high end, it's effectively an acoustic coax giving extremely uniform dispersion right the way through the mid band. But by far the most popular of the Wavefront 8 series was the W8C, the compact. Single 12 in the horn, the six and a half mid, and the one inch exit compression driver. Accompanied with its flow and bass box, very compact, hybrid loaded W8CS. And then there was the ground stack sub, the WSX. These were Martin Audio's leading touring products right up into the noughties and the introduction of line arrays. The rigging in the 8C was extremely flexible. It allowed these beautiful curved arrays to be created, allowing the arrays to be optimized to uh, minimize comb filtering, to create arrays uh, where one cabinet would be inverted on top of another to create better, longer throw. Um, very, very flexible system, very elegant, that also looked good. 
This is a Capital Sound gig, a very famous concert in the UK, the memorial concert for Princess Diana uh, after she met her untimely end in a tunnel in Paris. This concert was held in 1998 at her family home, um, Althrop House in Northamptonshire. Uh, yes, I know it's a strange way to pronounce a word where the R is over the O, but for some reason, that's just the way they do it. And you can see here the WACs with the stacks of WSX subs. Ocean Colour Scene, big tour here in the UK and in Europe again, WHC with Capital Sound. I was at that concert, actually. It sounded stunning. Then uh, another, this was a this was a sort of a, a left field product for Martin Audio that came out in uh, the 1990s. This is the ICT 300. Now we'd become part of the Tannoy Goodman's Industries Group, and they developed something called ICT technology. Now this was a parasitic metal dome that sat uh, in the middle of the voice center of the cone, and it re-radiated high frequency energy by inductive coupling from the magnetic structure behind, so it had no voice coil. Uh, so theoretically, it was impossible to blow your tweeters um, because they had no voice coil. But strangely, we still get requests for these drive units. They've no longer, uh, they're no longer in production and haven't been for many years, but it was a very, very popular product at the time. Uh, and no, you, you couldn't blow your top and unless you were very, very daft. And we did have some uh, drivers come in where people are so ridiculously overpowered or clipped their power amplifiers they'd actually managed to burn this metal diaphragm that was sat in the middle of the HF device. So uh, as a good lesson there in why you should all be using limiters, even with an ICT drive unit. 1996, we were on the move again to our current home at Halifax Road in High Wycombe much larger premises with a larger factory, much more space gave the company the room for the growth that would come. Product rise next along the line was uh, the Wavefront Theatre Series, WT3 on the left, WT2, uh, the little baby WT.5 and uh, the WTUB or WTUB as it affectionately became known, all designed for the theatre market. These came about because theatre sound designers loved the warmth and transparency of the W8C system, but it was a very inappropriate box uh, for use in theatres due to its size. Uh, hence a range based on the same drivers and technology, particularly the three-way on the left there, um, which brought that sound quality, but in a more compact form factor. Stunning sounding products. I've heard this system many times and it always, uh, always surprises me that uh, the, the three T in particular just manages to disappear, and you don't even realise that the system's running. It's such a beautiful neutral system. The cinema was another marketplace for Mars and Audio to venture into. It's quite a tricky uh, market because cinemas expect their systems to perform well, but cost next to nothing. Which is why you always see cinema systems with these very stripped back cabinets with very few frills on them. Of course. They're behind the screens, so nobody's going to see it. Uh, so aesthetics aren't of great importance, but performance is. Now, Dave was one of the first guy, or sorry, Bill Webb, uh, who designed these systems, one of the first guys to actually bring three-way systems into the cinema market. And boy, what a difference it made. Uh, there's a cinema equipped with these systems just up the road from High Wycombe, which is always my choice of place to go and see a new film because the sound is just so much better than uh, any of the conventional two-way or compression loaded mid systems that are in most cinemas. Again, we've got the separate devoted mid-range cone driven, bringing all that warmth and character to the system. Late 1990s and along came the iconic Blackline series, multi-purpose loudspeakers that were designed always to be um, just as useful as a portable PA system uh, for corporates, for bands, for mobile DJs, as they are for installation in clubs and pubs, where they became something of a staple right the way through the latter end of the 90s and through the noughties. The range covered everything from an eight inch two way through to the uh, H3 fully horn loaded three way system and subs from a diminutive but high performance single 12 wore out the way through to the double 18 S218. Blackline, of course, is a model name that uh, carries on through to the current day in its third iteration. So Blackline had Mark 1, then we went to the Blackline Plus, and then today's Blackline X. 
Black Lion also birthed a new series of installation loudspeakers. This was the AQ series, same drivers and crossovers, but in less complex cabinets and cabinets are MDF rather than uh, multi-grade ply, uh, because those things are just not needed in the install environment. But it does bring the cost down, but keeps the sound quality there. Then in 2002, Martin Audio's vertical odyssey began uh, with our first line array system, the W8L, a very large scale line array system. It very quickly evolved into the longbow with lessons learned from the initial system. Uniquely in the marketplace, it combines line array consistency in the vertical domain with properly pattern controlled horizontal, which was pretty much exclusive in the market at the time. So again, three-way, all horn loaded, the Martin Audio um, standard to get the efficiency and the power and the projection. It's a really was a really unique line array system and outperformed for pretty much everything else in the market for its ability to project mid and high frequencies to the back of the space. You can see again, there's the toroidal mid-range uh, mid phase plugs and that big mid-range horn. And in this case, four one-inch exit compression drivers and a hybrid loaded 15 taking of low frequency duties. It was a prodigiously loud box. It was down to 35 hertz at minus 3 dB, 141 dB peak uh, plus. I mean, that was uh, the, 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 the limiting factor bizarrely with this was the, was the mid range, the low end was so efficient. Uh, Capital Sound and RG Jones were two significant early adopters of the system and the system was out on tour with the likes of Kylie Minogue and Take That right the way through this era. And then in 2008, it completely transformed what was available to be heard in the audience for the front of house engineers at Glastonbury Festival. Meanwhile, reducing offsite noise, there's that thing again, um, because of careful planning to the system and also because of the software that Martin Audio had for W8L. Display 1.7 was the software. It was an early three-dimensional um, prediction software and was extremely accurate. And using it, we could design very large sites extremely accurately. And that was what won the Glastonbury gig for us back in 2008. Let's take that on tour. You can see there and 2008 to 2015 when MLA replaced Longbow on the main stage of Glastonbury for the first time. But this is Longbow in action. After long ago came um, W8LC, the compact version, using a single 12 hybrid on the low end, but the same mid and high frequency arrangements. And then the baby of the bunch, W8LM, a really innovative system. It runs two and a half way. So the two 18 inch drive units are running together down to the lowest frequency cutoff point. But the one that's reflex loaded on the left hand side has a filter in at about 350 hertz. The one that's behind the mid-range horn on the right-hand side and then carries on up to the crossover point of the two one-inch exit compression drivers there. Here's this Martin Audio theme again that you've seen right the way through from W8C through all our current systems as well. This idea of keeping cone-driven mid-range right the way up the frequency band to about three and a half, four K, so that we can use smaller one-inch exit compression drivers on the top end. Reduces distortion at the very high frequencies and gives a much cleaner high frequency reproduction. In 2003, it was all changed again, and I must apologize for the, pic the quality of this picture, but it's the only one I could find. The board of directors uh, led a management buyout of Martin Audio. It was then under the ownership of TC Group because uh, they bought out TGI several years previously. DBP there completing the buyout with was Rob Lingfield, you can see Bill Webb and a couple of other guys that I'm sad to say I don't recognize. Ministry of Sound. Well, a club that's called Ministry of Sound is always going to have to up the game where audio quality is concerned. And back in 2005, our long relationship with the venue started with WHL Longbow and Blackline Plus products in many of the rooms around this iconic London club that absolutely stakes its reputation on the quality of the sound. Then in 2010, there was the system in the box, multiple award winning over many years as the best club system anywhere in the world. It's incorporated our 21-inch um, driven hybrid horn ASX sub bass, 18-inch uh, folded horns for the upper bass, and custom versions of the W8C running on uh, the mid-high duties above. 
this really is quite a system to behold. It's like the sound swirls around you. It is truly immersive and intense, but at the same time of exceptional clarity and quality. Then in 2016, CDD-15s were added to this system as well uh, as part of an upgrade to a full Dolby Atmos immersive system. O-Line is a very important product for Martin Audio and a classic example of our uh, out of the box thinking when it comes to system design. It emerged into the market in 2007 when digitally steered columns were, uh, were rapidly becoming the product of choice for speech reproduction in difficult acoustic environments. O-Line achieved this through clever acoustic design and from being an articulated array. So um, very clever acoustic design in the horizontal meant it had consistent 100 degree horizontal coverage right the way through its operating range. And vertically, the coverage de is defined by the angles between the boxes, as with most touring array systems. The real difference with O-Line, though, is that it's a truly musical sounding system. It was never designed just to be a speech band product, and it sounds absolutely fantastic. But the key thing with O-Line is not just the product itself, it's what happened behind it, what was going on behind the scenes. So with O-Line, we started investigating the performance of the array because early prototypes were not measuring the same way as the prediction software. So we needed to measure, find out what was going on, what was different in the array that we weren't predicting in the software. This is something that as far as we're aware, we're the only people still taking into account in our prediction software and in our optimization software is the effect of one cabinet on another, the interaction between different cabinets in an array. So what we're looking at here is a boundary element model of a single O-line, and we're looking at its radiating pattern onto a mesh in front of it. As you'd expect, it's loud in front of the speaker and drops off as you move away from it. Nothing here is news. This, however, was news, and this is the critical thing. So we're looking now at an array of six O-line cabinets, and only the second box down, obviously the loudest one, is energized. The other five boxes are just sitting there with no voltage applied. And you can see this baffling effect, this re-radiation that's occurring from every other box in the array. Now, if you don't take into this into account, this is when your software goes awry. This is when things go wrong. And it can put you out by up to 6 dB because of this coupling effect between the boxes if you don't take that into account. Now, once you have the understanding of this and the algorithms for it embedded in your software, the world is your oyster in terms of what you can do to control your array. 2007 saw more management change at Martin Audio. Uh, the company was sold to Loud Technologies, um, a US-based company that also held Mackie, EAW, uh, Ampeg, and Washburn guitars under its banner. Up until that point, Anthony Taylor, who had become joint MD with David Bissett Powell, took over the reins entirely as David moved on to other things. Uh, and Rob Lingfield left at the same time to be replaced by Simon Bull, it was my first boss at Martin Audio, and the stage was set fair for the next exciting, innovative and unique development at Martin Audio. Now we come to MLA, something that completely changed the face of how people understand uh, how PA can be deployed and the capabilities of uh, a vertically hung PA system. A truly unique PA, the goals of which are to get everybody in the house to have the same frequency response and the same sonic experience, whether they're sitting down at the front or in the seats at the very highest back of the venue. Each cabinet has six power amplifier channels, it has six channels of DSP, so we can uniquely control through the Dis Display 2 software the performance of that array. Now, this was the brainchild of two people. Uh, Jason Baird, Martin Audio's Director of uh, Research and Development at the time, and Ambrose Thompson, our resident genius acoustic engineer. The system was made possible by turning the concept of a PA on its head, starting by defining what we want at the audience and then developing software and DSP that would allow an array to achieve that. So we're going backwards. We're not defining an array by the shape of what comes out of it. We're defining it by saying we want the audience to be covered in this way and making the system behave in the appropriate fashion. Now, this is based on that and all the understanding of array behavior that we got through the development of the O-Line system. 
The MLA cabinet itself is a full three-way horn loaded design. Here we are again, we are Martin Audio. We've got that same cone-driven mid-range section. We have our high frequency one inch exit compression drivers to give all that transient detail and information. And the box itself will go from 52 Hertz down to 52 Hertz minus three dB and generate a peak of 145 dB from a single cabinet. That's something else we've stuck with at Martin Audio plus six dB we reckon is a realistic peak level. It's the kind of extra level you'll get out of a modern class D power amplifier. Uh, a lot of our competitors have now moved to a plus 12 dB model for their maximum SPL, which we feel is a little unrealistic. So in display 2.3, this is the software that's behind all of our optimized systems. You define your audience space, where your audience isn't, and where you put your hard avoid. Now, the goals of the system here, the software is entirely goal-based. Uh, we give it goals to achieve and it does its level best to achieve them. So from the audience plane, the green area, we want the same frequency response from the front to the back of the space as close as we possibly can. In the red area, the system's goal is to attenuate that level by about 20 dB, keeping sound away from the regions that we don't want it. Then we have the cherry on the top, the hard avoid. Now, hard avoid, the system's goal is to achieve 30 dB of attenuation against the level in the audience space. Most commonly, we see this put on stages to reduce contamination on the stage and get a cleaner mix, or on festival sites, it's so often used to reduce off-site noise. It gives the ability to, at the end of the coverage region defined within the software, put a filter so that the system will actively steer the pattern of the system away from those regions, reducing the level that goes into outside areas. This in particular, combined with MLA's exceptional sound quality, are what made it a festival favourite around the world. Two in particular here in the UK, the British Summertime Festivals in Hyde Park, which were threatened to be shut down completely before MLA came on the scene with the ability to not upset the neighbours whilst maintaining proper rock concert sound levels for the audience. And likewise, for the same reasons, at Glastonbury Festival in the UK, where year after year, more and more stages are covered by Martin Audio product. MLA was accompanied by the MLX. Now this is an absolutely incredible subwoofer capable of 150 dB peak output at one meter and a half space. It has two hybrid loaded high power 18 inch drivers in it and is powered by uh, PowerSoft iPal technology. This compares the input of the subwoofer to the output so that regardless of the level, whether it's playing a bowed double bass or the hardest of hard house, it has the same sonic impact and quality at low level or at high level. And that really is the genius behind these stunning subwoofers. MLA Compact joined the family in 2012, bringing this unique technology to a wider marketplace. Not only has this been very successful as a smaller format system in its own right, or as an augmentation to larger MLA arrays, but also in the installation marketplace, where its ability to control its output, just like its bigger brother, means that it works well in really difficult acoustic environments, such as large houses of worship. You can see there MLA compact being used as outhangs to a main MLA PA system. Then in 2014, along came MLA Mini, a slightly different form of factor. Uh, MLA Mini is a two way box. It's bi amplified. It uses two six and a half inch drive units for the low end and three 1.4 inch diaphragm high frequencies down the center of the box. And the unique thing with MLA Mini is that uh, the whole front baffle becomes the horn flare for those high frequency devices in the middle with exceptional horizontal pattern control. MLA Mini is powered by uh, the MSX box. You can see there the, the flow in MLA Mini. This is at Henley Festival. The MSX is a single 15 subwoofer to complement the MLA Mini cabinets themselves, but also in the back of it is housed all the processing and amplification to drive the array. So the system works in modules of four arrays plus a sub. You can build them into arrays up to uh, three, uh, three subs with 12 tops or single hangs of 16 MLA mini elements. Stunning sound quality, lots of power and a very small form factor. It's become very popular, particularly in corporate AV markets due to its aesthetic appearance and its exceptional performance. 
comes the CDD installation series introduced in 2015, the year I, year after I started at Martin Audio. It's remained the most successful installation series that Martin Audio have ever produced for two reasons. One is its exceptional sound quality, uh, and the other is its ability to make sure that everybody in front of it is getting that same sound quality. That's because it uses a coaxial point source drive unit, so there's no crossover distortion between the two and uh, an asymmetric dispersion pattern. Now, this is why we chose to use a coaxial drive unit. A conventional two-way loudspeaker has a problem in the crossover region. Right the way through the crossover region, the two drive units are reproducing the same sounds. They arrive at your ears at different times, and that causes a phase cancellation and a dip in response of crossover, as you can see in the graph at the right -hand side, top right-hand side there. Now, having a coaxial drive unit overcomes this problem because both drivers are in the same place. So there's no difference in arrival time, therefore no difference in phase when it gets to your ears. There's a CDD box for pretty much every installation application through the five and six inch, through an eight inch, 10 inch, 12 inch and 15, all using the same basic differential dispersion coaxial technology. They're also available as a weatherized loudspeaker for use in outdoor areas, but we also now manufacture a full marine version. Now these are designed for use on beach bars and on the outer decks of cruise ships uh, to particularly withstand that very harsh environment of salt water and being exposed right out in all weathers. CDD Live came about from the CDD drive unit, taking that exceptional drive unit and getting the very, very best out of it by integrating it in a tour grade enclosure with a suite of electronics. The electronics on board gives you DSP control over the loudspeaker itself and gives you Dante audio networking. So over the same digital network, you can both control and get audio to your system. Perfectly happy to run as a standalone system with presets on board for multiple operations, or you can control it remotely via a PC and audio input is analog or as we said via, or analog via XLR, sorry, or digital via Dante. Dual Class D power amplifiers and an active crossover with all the necessary limiting and processing, looking after that CDD drive unit and making sure that we get the very best performance from it. Monitor World has always been an integral part of the Martin Audio story. Uh, the performers being able to hear everything they need to hear all the time is a key to them being able to give their best performance, thereby giving the audience a great night out. So models through the, the original uh, LE 100s, through the LE 12s, LE 400s, those custom Perspex wedges you saw that were made for the Eurovision Song Contest back in 2003. But most recently in 2017, saw the introduction of two new monitor ranges from Martin Audio. First was the LE series incorporating those CDD drive units for exactly the same reasons. Uh, our monitors need to give even consistent performance so the performer gets the same tonal balance and can always hear themselves regardless of where they're standing in front of the wedge. In this case, it's wider in the near field, narrower in the far field to project the sound upstage. Then there's the ultimate expression of that idea, the XE series, with newly developed very high output drive units and very long deep waveguides that go all the way from the HF diaphragm at the back of the box through the pole piece of the magnet up onto the cone and continued out onto the baffle of the wedge itself, giving monitor loudspeakers of exceptional performance and pattern control with very, very high SPLs. Change again at Martin Audio in 2018, uh, when a management buyout was led by our new managing director, Dom Harter, supported by LDC, which released Martin Audio from under the auspices of what became uh, Loud Audio, previously Loud Technologies. This enabled some investment into the business and for the large suite of new products that have been coming out of Martin Audio ever since to become reality. First up was Black Line X, a ground up reboot of the Black Line series, retaining all the sonic character and reliability of this legendary range of products, but re-engineered to a more accessible price point, opening up a whole new market of customers to Martin Audio, bringing exceptional sound quality uh, to more and more users. 
the range still covers everything from an eight inch two-way to a 15 inch two-way with a suite of subs in the range again a true multi-purpose cabinet it can be used as a portable or an installed system as main pa or monitors special notice to the newest product in the range you can see at the bottom left there that's the x218 a brand new subwoofer which is frankly stunning performance at its price point May 2019 powered versions of Black Lion X came out, a 12 inch and a 15 and single 18 sub. Combining this exceptional sound quality uh, with the convenience of onboard power, processing and even mixing uh, with two analog inputs into the back and Bluetooth connectivity. It's been a phenomenally successful series with plaudits around the world. Uh, if you go on YouTube, there's no end of people who've reviewed this product and are absolutely loving it. It's obvious marketplace, of course, is portable systems for DJs and bands, but it is finding its way also into the installation market where people don't have room, for example, to put amplifier racks, a powered system is the perfect solution. 2017 brought Wavefront Precision to the market. Um, all the advanced technology of MLA through a new concept called scalable resolution and at a more accessible price point. Wavefront Precision takes our optimization technology and packages it differently. So now rather than having the power amplifiers in the back of the boxes and multiple amplifier channels, the way we do with MLA, we have external amplifiers in racks and the boxes themselves either run from a single or two amplifier channels, making it far more cost effective, but still with all the benefits of an optimized system. Scalable resolution means you can change the number of cabinets you can you connect to your amplifier channels. So at the lowest resolution, for example, uh, on WPC, that's three box. Uh, it means you're getting more control than you would with the standard unprocessed array, but it doesn't give you the ultimate control for an audience space that it would do by having single box connected to single DSP channel and power amplifier. That much is pretty obvious, but it enables you to tailor your system to the budget you have available while still taking advantage of optimization technology. 2017 was the birth of the range with WPM and WPC, the unpowered cousins of the MLA Mini and MLA Compact. Same driver complements, but in this case, WPM is passive rather than biamped, and WPC is a biamped three way rather than the five amplifier channels and processing that's in MLA Compact. WPL, the largest of the range and based on the design of MLA, came to market in January 2018. The largest system in the range of exceptional power and output. It has the same dual 12 inch hybrid loaded low end, two six and a half inch mids and three one inch exit compression drivers on the top. Latest in the range launched last year is WPS, a quite stunning little system which manages to pack enormous power and punch into a very compact enclosure dual eight inch low frequency four four inch compression loaded cone drivers on the mid and four one inch exit compression drivers on the high end wp series has been an immediate success worldwide hugely successful on our biggest selling array loudspeakers that we've ever made from touring through to installation, they just become more and more successful and more and more popular as people's eyes are open to the potential of this optimized PA basis. WPS, this is, you can see here on a comedy tour with Capital Sound, they've been out with both Tim Minchin um, uh, and Eddie Izzard on tours in UK, two of the UK's biggest comedians. And this is WPL. Uh, I was uh, lucky enough to go and system tech this gig. It's an annual event at Leeds Castle, a medieval site in the southeast of England, an annual classical event. It really is quite something with Spitfire fly past and the Royal Artillery firing off massive guns. It really is quite an event. Those two arrays of uh, 12 WPL were throwing about 155 meters. And at 155 meters, I could still hear all the timbre and resonance of the ting of a triangle, 155 meters from those arrays. Absolutely incredible PA system. They weren't on their own. There was uh, an outhang of 12 WPL for a foot, because it's a very wide site on a wide delay. And there were two hangs of eight WPC on that gig as well. All in all, a fantastic outing for the WP series, and it really did sound impressive. 
Then in December last year, um, the LDC backed Martin Audio was sold to Focusrite PLC uh, with Dom Harter continuing as our managing director. Focusrite are based just around the corner from us as a, a business, Focusrite PLC, own Focusrite Audio Engineering, who are responsible for things like the RedNet Dante series, a wide range of studio hardware, microphone pre's, that kind of thing, worldwide renowned for their quality and their love of high quality audio. Uh, also Novation Keyboards, Adam Studio Monitoring over in Germany. So a perfect fit for Martin Audio, a bunch of equally obsessed audio types all under one roof. 2019 saw the introduction of a new uh, range of product for Martin Audio. That's the Adorn series in the commercial space, not somewhere we've dipped our toes previously. We thought we had something to offer here, focusing on bringing uh, exceptional sound quality to the marketplace, which is not always what these type of products are aimed for. Started with the two wall mount loudspeakers uh, last year, and this year we introduced the pendants and a range of ceiling loudspeakers. All sound fantastic, and they're a great entry level point into the Martin Audio sound. So what happens next? Well, we will be continuing with new product launches. Uh, our uh, a new product launch strategy for the next couple of years is still exhaustive. There's lots of exciting new stuff coming out. So keep your eyes peeled on social media and on our website uh, and in the trade press for announcements and launches of very exciting new products. It's been an incredible, innovative uh, 50 years for the company and still retains a great group of people working in the business who are just as obsessed as Dave Martin was at keeping that fantastic Martin Audio sound uh, and the reliability and quality products as we move into the future. It's certainly a great place to work, even under the current circumstances. We couldn't really go through our history without talking about all of us spending the last four or five months, whatever it is, I've now lost count, uh, working from home. Uh, we're all sat in various different circumstances, doing our best to keep the company going, keep our customers happy, and we're still developing new products even under these circumstances. So as I say, keep your eyes peeled. My colleagues have all been fantastic, incredible team spirit um, between all of us while we've all been working at home. Uh, and with the support of our fabulous customers and our distributors and our partners all over the world, lots of exciting things to come as we continue our business through the years.